Okay, well, we're back um, ending the recess. We, we um, solved our technical issues, so thank you. Due to the current local, state, and federal emergency declarations and guidance regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting of the Minneapolis Board of Education is being conducted in accordance with Minnesota Statute 13D.021, with the majority of members participating remotely via electronic means. This meeting is being live streamed on our website and on channel 15, and a recording will be available in both places. Before, we'll be, before we begin, I'll note some legal and process expectations for both the board and the public listening. First, as required by law, we will take every vote by roll call. I will ask the clerk to call the roll by district order, followed by at-large members. Board members, please mute yourselves when not talking to avoid background noise. During discussions, directors on Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature to be recognized. Directors here in the room, please let me know. Actually, raise your hand. And finally, for the benefit of all of us, but in particular for our interpreters and those using closed captions, please remember to speak clearly, slowly, and into your microphone. Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll? Director Arneson. Here. Director Alamin. Here. Director Ali. Here. Director Cerio. Here. Director Inns. Here. Director Jordan. Here. Director Caprini. Present. Director Polly is here. Chair Allison. Here, thank you. We have a quorum. Next, we will approve our agenda for the evening. Director Arneson, will you please move to approval of the agenda? So moved. May I have a second with last name for the record? Second, second Jordan. Our agenda has been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing no hands, Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll on the agenda? Director Arneson. Yes. Director Alamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surreal. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Dr. Polly is yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and we have an approved agenda. Director Polly, will you please move approval of the minutes before us? So moved. May I have a second with last name for the record? Second, Arneson. Thank you. The minutes as presented for the May 11, 2021 meeting have been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing no hands, Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll? Director Arneson. Yes. Director Alamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surreal. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Yes. Director Polizzi, yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the minutes have been adopted. Superintendent Graff, I will turn it over to you to start us off with recognitions. Thank you, Chair Ellison, uh, Student Representative Gebra Mesko, board members, members of the public and staff who are here with us tonight. Um, I'd just like to take a moment first tonight to highlight the special recognition um, of one of our former students uh, that they recently received. Darnella Frazier last week was awarded a special citation by the International Pulitzer Board because of her role in the video of Mr. George Floyd's murder. Um, and what that played in igniting a global movement against police violence and as evidence in the recent trial of Derek Chauvin, former MPD officer. The committee officials who gave out this prestigious prize said Frazier's recording highlighted the crucial role of citizens in journalists, uh, quests for truth and justice. Ms. Frazier has received praise for what she did from around the world, including from President Biden. And Minneapolis Public Schools would like to join, in, join the world in recognizing Ms. Frazier for her courage and willingness to, to look fear in the face. Like her, we all wish a different outcome had resulted and that Mr. Floyd was here today uh, to, to fight in person. But we want to thank her for the personal sacrifice she made to share what she saw 
and endure the endless attention, questions, and pain we know she must uh, be experiencing as a result. So thank you again, Ms. Frazier, and congratulations on your well-deserved recognition. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Superintendent, and congratulations, Darnella. Our city, our country, and our world um, has a lot to learn from you. Um, as we seek to do the right and often difficult thing, you showed us how to use our voice without saying a word. And so I wanna thank you again from all of us. I'm gonna pause now, see if any directors wish to add a comment. Director Elamine. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do want to again just thank you, um, Darnella, for your bravery. I mean, the boldness, the patience, the um, advocacy that you show to the world. It's just, it's, it's so powerful. And I just wanted to thank you, personally thank you myself from the district for your bravery again. Your name will continue to carry on in history for this brave, bold movement that you did for us, for the world. And again, I can't thank you enough. Seeing how you just was able to remain patient, uh, remain steady, remain calm, remain diligent, all the above goes to you. And I just wanna say thank you from myself, my family, our community, to your family. And just um, thank you again, thank you. Thank you, Director Elamain. Again, Darnella, thank you so much from the Minneapolis School Board. We're so proud. Um, our next item is the required public hearing on the proposed closure of the Tuttle Building as a schoolhouse, which we will vote on later in the meeting. In accordance with Minnesota Statute 123B.2.51, Subdivision 5, those wishing to provide testimony for or against the recommendation to close the school building were provided the opportunity to leave a voicemail. Notice that this hearing was published in the district's official newspaper and also posted online. We did not receive any comments for this hearing. Our next item is our standard public comment process. As we've done throughout the pandemic, public comments for tonight's meeting were accepted in advance by voicemail and messages will be played in the order in which they were received. I'll now ask staff to play the public comments. Thank you. Hello, my name is Reeve Gridgeway. I'm an MTS parent who lives in Marcy Holmes. I grew up attending desegregated schools in Montclair, New Jersey. Some of my most formative experiences have been with high quality teachers who believe, me, believe in me, had high expectations, empathy, and show me the brilliance black teachers can bring to a classroom. I urge MTS to focus efforts on providing quality teaching to all MTS students. We can do this by reevaluating our teacher placement practices and reward teachers that have proven results with student growth. We have racialized academic and opportunity gaps that are among the worst in the nation. I implore MPS to reevaluate teacher placement practices and determine a more equitable approach. Teacher equity impacts the school's culture and climate and should be given the board's full attention. Thank you. Gary Marvin Davis and New Salem Educational Initiative, just a few blocks from the district where you cheat these students academically every day your feet hit the ground. I know this. My students come from the Minneapolis Public Schools and I know just how lousy your schools are. One of the poignant things is though, is that uh, I try to keep all of my students in the Minneapolis Public Schools, have them go to your lousy schools and get their real education from me in the two hours that they spend with me every week. Some of them, though, I cannot uh, keep in the Minneapolis public schools, and they escape trying to get a better education at Ascension or Cooper or Armstrong in Plymouth. They don't really get a better education there because the teachers and administrators are trained in the same way by the same low-life education professors that train the administrators and teachers at the Minneapolis public schools. This is the dilemma. 
So it's poignant. All they get when they escape the Minneapolis public schools is a little bit less drama. So I am intent that the school district that serves the greater number of our students in Minneapolis is going to get better. It will not do that unless you invite outside scholars, university professors, who really know something, to redesign your curriculum and retrain your teachers. You will do that over time. I intend to keep exerting pressure through my blog, through my book, my many forums to make you do that. You know that I am the guy that you will never fool. Hello, my name is Emmy higgs Matzner, and my daughter is starting kindergarten with MPS this September. I'm calling to urge you to prioritize teacher equity immediately. I was horrified to learn recently that some teachers are placed at schools without the principal's input and that principals aren't allowed to hire teachers from outside the district, even if they think they're the most qualified to serve that particular school's needs. I used to work with an after-school program at Green Central. I didn't know about that practice at the time, but I could easily tell which teachers really wanted to be there and which were waiting to move on, most likely toward whiter and wealthier schools. There were many fabulous teachers who were truly invested in working at Green and many staff members of color who had a special connection with the students. Many of these staff members were not classroom teachers, however, and we desperately need more teachers who will reflect their students' identities and who can ensure success for students of color. This board has a responsibility to publicly address teacher equity in MPS and redesign the system to fully meet the needs of students of color in our district. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joanne Brockington. I'm a parent with two kids at Bancroft Elementary School. I'm calling to ask the school board to deeply examine our systems as it relates to teacher equity. In order for equity and empathy to exist in society at large, our children need to do more than simply be told that all people deserve equitable opportunities. They actually need to experience it firsthand. They need to personally know a variety of leaders in their life from different backgrounds. What I'm seeing for my children is that they could go through their entire 13 years at Minneapolis Public Schools and never have a BIPOC teacher. This reinforces beliefs that whiteness is the dominant or preferred option. And since the current system is set up to protect the jobs of our current overwhelmingly white teaching staff, this is unlikely to be disrupted on its own. So what I'm asking for is that Minneapolis Public Schools makes it a public priority to reimagine this system so that students of color in particular can see themselves in their teachers. This is an important step towards achieving better outcomes and meeting the needs of students of color in Minneapolis public schools. Thank you. My name is Dorita Stanchevich and I am a parent of a student in Minneapolis public schools. The board of MPS has a responsibility to ensure that students of color and low income students are not disproportionately served by ineffective and inexperienced teachers. My own experience as a public school student demonstrated very clearly to me that the identification of student potential and aptitude happens with tenured teachers that standardized tests often miss. As a student, my family was a free and reduced lunch eligible family and my father is an immigrant. My parents both worked shift jobs and did their best to navigate the public school system. In eighth grade, I was not identified to have accelerated math potential through standardized testing. We did not know how to push back on this assessment. In ninth grade, my algebra teacher, Mr. Taylor, sat down with my parents and me to explain that standardized tests did not always capture talent in math, and he felt strongly that I was a student they failed to capture. He then helped us map out a new academic path for me in high school that allowed me to accelerate my math curriculum and find renewed confidence in my math skills. Today, I work in real estate, modeling financial projections for multifamily affordable housing projects, heavily relying on my math skills. I wholeheartedly believe that Mr. Taylor's insights into student potential came through his long experience as a teacher, and I believe that all students in MPS, particularly students of color, should have access to experienced teachers like Mr. Taylor so that they can realize their full potential. 
I demand that MPS make it a public priority to, to, to disrupt the racist trends and patterns of our city's resources moving towards whiteness and wealth. You can do this by redesigning your policies, practices, and contracts away from centering teacher choice and towards meeting the needs of our students of color across the district. We owe it to our students to center them in this work. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patrick Shirley. I live in Minneapolis and I have two students that go to Washburn High School in Minneapolis. I would like to see the board set up time in the immediate future to follow up on the presentation from September of 2019, the HREDIA, and receive an update on the teacher equity plan. Thank you. Hello, my name is Holly Cragthorpe Shirley, and I'm a Minneapolis parent. Uh, we have two children at Washburn High School, and I would like to see the board address uh, teacher equity. Um, it's not okay that our schools are most likely um, to serve BIPOC students. Um, sorry, it is not okay that schools who mostly serve BIPOC students are consistently experiencing a higher teacher turnover, um, an increased number of late hires, less experienced staff, and a higher rate of teachers who are simply placed in those schools. There are many ways that we can address this issue, and it would be amazing if the schools with the highest poverty concentrations were consistently treated as the most prestigious workplaces and that they were able to easily hire and retain the teachers that they wanted to. Um, so I'm part of the Advancing Equity Coalition, and in September of 2019, the board received a presentation of the inequitable distribution of experienced and effective teachers. And since then, we haven't heard any public discussion about this issue and what is being done to ensure students of color have equitable access to our high quality teachers. Um, I'd like to see the board set up a time and place in the immediate future to address this um, so that we can receive an update on the teacher equity plan. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Jessie. I am the mother of two, a uh, rising kindergartner and a rising second grader um, at MPS. And I just want to, I want you guys to talk about um, teacher distribution and how the more um, experienced teachers and end up at the widest school. It'd be really nice to see um, some good distribution of teachers that have experience all throughout the city. Um, I know my students are moving from a Southwest Minneapolis school to a Northeast Minneapolis school, and we are kind of surprised by the changes that we're seeing. So although we're gonna recognize a couple of teachers headed Northeast from our school, it would be nice to see a distribution of teachers that have experience and are also interested in helping kids in different parts of the city, not just Southwest Minneapolis. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Ellen Gettler. I'm an MPS parent of two soon-to-be Bethune students. I have given public comment before about how much I valued my own experience growing up in integrated schools in St. Paul. It's why I supported the CDD. But I wanna talk about a layer deeper than what I think is the good start of integrating buildings. Because my schools growing up were integrated buildings, but my classes were not integrated classes. The accelerated courses in my high school were challenging and exciting and the students in them were almost all white like me and what i learned was that almost every one of the few black students in my accelerated courses had a story about a teacher who told them they shouldn't take the course or their parent who had to fight to change back their entire class roster after the advanced classes they registered for were changed story after story of school staff and teachers discouraging, sometimes blocking black students from taking accelerated courses. So this is almost three decades ago. Then this year, I heard a recent Washburn grad and former board student rep tell a story about his sophomore AP chemistry class. He did just fine in the class, but his teacher originally refused to give him the, same, the teacher recommendation that was required to register for the course. Brilliant black students, same experience of being discouraged by a teacher. And I'm seeing MPS's data from 2018 through 2020 that's showing that not even 50% of African-American students in our district 
have taken and passed a single advanced course. So I want to put to this board, and I'm also bringing this to MFT, how will the two bodies that have the authority and mandate work together to comply with the legal requirement that students of color in our district have the teaching that moves them ahead in their brilliance? Hello, my name is Allison Moore, and I am a white parent of two white kids at Hale Community School. Um, I know firsthand how our educational system prioritizes my white privileged kids over kids of color and low-income students in MPS at Hale. Uh, my kids have had many skilled, caring, compassionate educators, and I have seen how this experience over time builds a culture of learning and growth within a school community. I know this is not a universal experience across MPS, and we really need to question why we are not guaranteeing that students of color and low-income students receive the highest quality education possible from the most talented and amazing educators MPS has to offer. We need to question what structures and policies are in place to incent teachers to move towards wealthier and whiter schools. I urge the board to prioritize the needs of low-income students and students of color and disrupt the racist practices that are not serving them any longer. Prioritize teacher equity now so we can truly create a system where all students can thrive. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Farhia. I have uh, four children at 10 Minneapolis, high school, middle, and elementary. And my comment for you is, uh, the board members, what are you doing about retaining and maintaining uh, teachers, teachers, teachers of color? And what are the plans to recruiting more so our children, students of color, can see themselves uh, in those classrooms having a teacher that looks like them, uh, that supports them both socially, academically. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Hello, my name is Colette McIver, and I'm a current MPS parent of a 7th, 5th grader, and kindergarten at Lake Harriet Community School. Our three children have benefited from our whiteness as well as our wealth, both while students at Burroughs and currently at Lake Harriet. Due to our skin color and economic status, our children have gained unfair access to the most experienced and, in most cases, the most effective teachers in the district. Our children have not benefited from having a teacher of color over the past seven years, nor have their white teachers been evaluated by student outcomes. Additionally, as you are aware, over the past three weeks, current and former students at Lake Harriet Upper have publicly shared their experiences of racism within the classroom from a member of the current teaching staff. This is unacceptable in 2021. In MPS, we have a system of teacher movement and distribution that is driven by teacher choice and replicates the historically racist trends and patterns of our city's resources moving towards whiteness and wealth. According to the Every Student Succeeds Act and World's Best Workforce legislation, the MPS School Board has a responsibility to ensure students of color and low-income students are not disproportionately served by ineffective and inexperienced teachers. North Elementary teachers have an average of 9.6 years of experience, while Southwest Elementary teachers have double that of 17. Only one out of 10 North Elementary teachers have over 15 years of experience, compared to eight out of 10 here at Southwest Elementary School. These statistics do not paint a picture of equity. This is unacceptable in 2021. I have accepted a seat on our Lake Harriet State Council equity team. Our family will continue to enroll and contribute to this district for the next 12 years. As such, I demand that MPS make it a public priority to disrupt the racist trends and redesign the system through policies, practices, and contracts to better meet the needs of all MPS students of color across the district. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, my name is Zainab Omar. I have two children at Barton Elementary, um, fifth grade and fourth grade. I'm also a former um, bilingual aide. Um, what I want like to um, talk about today is a couple of things. Uh, first, we must identify and provide systematic help to those who fall behind at school and reduce year retention. We also must straighten the links between school and home to help disadvantaged parents with their children to learn. We must respond to diversity and provide for successful inclusion of migrants and minorities within mainstream education. Ultimately, what, we're, what I would like is building a more equitable educational environment 
for the students to get empowered, making sure all students have what they need to succeed in classroom and beyond. These include students with special ed, English language learners like myself, gifted and talented and other students with diverse educational needs. Students and teachers also bring unique perspectives to the classroom, and they include different bias, trauma, identities, experience, assumption, background. There is no such thing as a typical student. And if education doesn't work, actively work to break down those existing barriers, it will end up reinforcing the inequalities that we were all there. I thank you so much, Minneapolis, for hearing me. And also, I want to add that personal experience as well very quickly. I know I'm running out of time, but I wanted to, I once wanted to become a teacher, and there were several barriers for black women. First, I was a, two, a mother of two children, and I couldn't get up work for four months in order to do student teaching. That was horrible. I've gone through. I did it, but with the help of my coworkers who actually donated money. Through that donation is why I was able to provide for my, my, my children the four months that I was doing student teaching. I do not want anybody to go through that. I was mentally exhausted. I was stressed out. I was um, psychologically damaged. Everything, I financially, I was really in pain. Those four months were the worst four months. Hi, my name is Paula Luxemburg, and I'm a parent of MPS students. I am calling to ask the board to make it a public priority to develop anti-racist policies, practices, and contracts that ensure that all students, and particularly students of color across the district, have access to the teachers who are best fit for them and will ensure that each student is making at least one year of growth per year. We know from a presentation that was presented to the board back in September of 2019 that we have a system of teacher movement in Minneapolis where as teachers become more experienced and therefore get more um, priority under the contract, teachers tend to head towards the schools that are the whitest and the wealthiest. This does not serve any of our students well. And it is actually the board's legal obligation to disrupt this pattern. Under the Every Student Succeeds Act and the World's Best Workforce legislation, you have a responsibility to ensure that students of color and low-income students are not disproportionately served by ineffective and inexperienced teachers. I really, really hope that the board, that district leaders, and that union leaders can work together to come up with creative solutions, win-win solutions, that protect teachers' rights as employees and that put students first in terms of making sure that every student in every school is able to hire the teachers who are best for our students of color. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie DeArmond and I am a MPS parent of two children, I'm calling asking the board to support policies that grow the ranks of our teachers of color. We need hiring practices that will allow teachers of color to thrive at MPS where 65% of our students are black and brown and less than 10% of our classroom teachers are non-white. At my children's own beloved school, we have seen this play out where Amazing teachers of color are accessed and lose their classroom positions, while longtime white teachers are given a pass year after year, even after their harsh discipline of black students is well documented by parent complaints. We must have teachers in our schools that look like our students. Thank you for listening to the board and admins. Bye bye. Hello, my name is Jackie Kale, and I'm the parent of elementary and middle school students in Minneapolis Public Schools. Since returning to the school following the pandemic, I have observed some alarming teacher behavior after school. I've seen white children playing and running around the pickup area with great deal of bodily autonomy. They are happy, carefree, throwing water on each other, running through the landscaping, pushing each other around. Then turning around, I have seen a teacher pull at the arm of her black student, hauling that student into line. I have seen other black kids yelled at for running through the landscaping. I've seen a black child happily bouncing a ball, which was then quickly taken away by his white teacher. 
This disparity in bodily autonomy mirrors the disparity in discipline data published by Minneapolis Public Schools. I strongly feel that these children need to be treated more equitably. I wonder what's happening inside the building, what's happening inside the classroom. According to the Every Student Succeeds Act and World's Best Workforce Legislation, the school board has a responsibility to ensure students of color and low-income students are not disproportionately served by ineffective or inexperienced teachers. Are teachers who have been coached to do a better job really doing a better, more equitable job? In Minneapolis Public Schools, the system of teacher movement and distribution, which is driven by teacher choice, seems to perpetuate the historical racist trends and patterns of our city's resources moving toward whiteness and wealth. We demand that Minneapolis Public Schools make it a public priority to disrupt these racist trends and redesign the system through policies, practices, and contracts to better meet the students, better meet the needs of our students of color across the entire district. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Anna Borowski, and I have two kids that will be entering kindergarten at MPS soon. Um, teacher equity is important to me because I know how critical teachers that can personally identify with their students are. Um, I'm white, so while I cannot, while it's not the same struggle, I can relate to this issue because I'm gay. Um, in high school, there were no out teachers at my school, but one day a group of friends and I participated in the National Day of Silence. It's a uh, protest to, it's a protest against the discrimination of LGB, LGBTQ people in schools. Um, one of my teachers, when we walked into their classroom, teared up and thanked us profusely. It felt so important uh, for both me and that teacher to see our shared identity um, represented at school. Students of color deserve that too. This board has a legal responsibility to ensure students of color and low-income students aren't disproportionately taught by ineffective and inexperienced teachers. Uh, currently, teacher movement and distribution shows historically racist patterns. Resources are moving toward whiteness and wealth. I stand with, so, with many others to demand that MPS makes it a public priority to disrupt racist trends and redesign the system with better policies, practices, and contracts. It's time. Thanks. Bye. My name is Jessica Hoyt. I'm the parent of a graduating fourth grader at Hale. I'm calling about our students of color and low-income students who are currently disproportionately served by often inexperienced and ineffective teachers. In Minneapolis, public schools, unfortunately, um, teacher choice drives the system of teacher placement. And what that does is results right now in continued patterns within our city that, um, that really built our city and divided our city. And so we've got whiteness and resources and wealth congregating at the South end. And I'm an educator myself. I know in districts, in big districts, this is, this is not uncommon, but I think we have to remind ourselves of what our responsibility is and who we serve. And our responsibility is to students and families first. And we have to get, we have to get clear on that. And we need to center the needs of each and every student and family in our district. And that is who we make decisions for. And when we're not making decisions for students and families, we have to ask ourselves why. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves about that. And then we have to get in the way of what's happening. So we need to start removing barriers in policy and in contracts that right now are systematically denying the education that our students need and deserve. And we're talking again about our students of color and our students who are living in low income situations and neighborhoods. We need to do what's right. You need to take a stand. You need to get uncomfortable. You need to move ahead and do the right thing. Hi, my name is Heather Anderson. I am a parent um, of two students uh, currently at Justice Page Middle School. We will be heading to Jefferson next year. I'm calling today just to, to ask our board to have a substantive conversation um, about 
how far out of compliance we are with the Every Student Succeeds Act and the world's best workforce legislation. So we know that we have a responsibility to make sure that students of color and low-income students are getting access to the things that they need. We know that we have a responsibility to do that. We also know that in our city, we have patterns, literally, that you could overlay, right, in housing and opportunity and healthcare and air quality in equitable access to schools and resources. We could overlay each one of those, and we know that we would all see racist patterns tending toward whiteness and privilege. We know that is true about the way that teachers move in our district as well. And so today, I'm just I'm just really asking the board to interrupt this pattern. It's not um, it's our responsibility. We have students who have needs next year. They need we have students who need to make one and a half, two, three years worth of growth next year. Students of color, and we need to see the the teacher that will meet their needs best in front of them. And I think that this is an urgent issue. I think it is a timely issue, and I think it is one. Um, that I think our board has the courage to have. I really, I, I really believe that our city, after what our students have been through this year, and um, I believe that our board and our city are ready to have this conversation. I think it's time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carrie Johnson. I'm an MPS parent of twin rising second graders. We'll be at Armitage this coming fall. Um, uh, over the last two years, my two second coming second graders have had six general education teachers over the last two years, and I've had the experience of seeing up close and personal what it's like to have um, different types of teachers of different effectiveness, even in one building um, while those two children were going through kindergarten and first grade, both in person and in distance learning. Um, that's given me a really um, an interesting perspective to see how different teachers can operate um, even using the same curriculum. Also, as a volunteer with the district, I've had the opportunity to um, look at how our systems operate and how uh, teachers are distributed throughout the district and how different effectiveness and experience of teachers goes throughout our district. Um, this board has a responsibility to the state under the world's best workforce legislation to assure that um, students of color, indigenous students, and low-income students are not disproportionately served by um, less experienced and uh, perhaps less effective teachers. And right now, I believe that our system of distribution of teachers um, that's driven by, by teacher choice is um, perpetuating um, a system based on racism that is uh, creating a system where we are not meeting this goal under the world's best workforce uh, goal to make sure that these students are not disproportionately served. Um, I encourage the board to look at this teacher equity um, question more closely and to make changes to assure that all students are being served by, proportionately by the most effective students and that uh, teachers are, are being moved around to schools in the most effective way possible. Hi, my name is Teresa, and I'm a graduate of the Minneapolis Public Schools and the parent of a soon-to-be fifth grader. Both my son and I have had amazing things come out of our time in MPS, moments when a trusted adult gave praise or encouragement, and we felt a true belonging. Um, in contrast, we've also had moments of disappointment and hurt when we felt dismissed or disbelieved. And of course, those memories remain terribly sharp. Um, I'm calling today because students of color are disproportionately hurt in our district. We know that teachers hugely influence the lives of their students and that being able to relate to and connect with a teacher in a positive way has a lasting impact. But the brilliance of so many students of color is actively squelched in MPS by teachers whose words and actions are hurtful and by the simple lack of teachers who look like them and can really relate on a deep cultural level. My son and I have been able to see ourselves in many of our teachers, but students of color too often see themselves in none. So as contract negotiations continue and hiring policies are scrutinized and funding decisions are made, I'm asking you to take equitable action to ensure that every student has the positive experience and quality education they deserve and have a right to. Please 
Make pathways for teachers of color to flood the classroom. Change hiring practices and seniority rules so that there's more equitable job security. Create a real accountability system. In no other industry is there zero consequence for poor performance, including displaying racist, sexist, or ableist prejudice. It's unacceptable. So change is long overdue, and I hope these changes are part of your legacy as the gatekeepers for the children of the public schools. Thanks, and have a good day. Hi, my name is Deborah Klein, and I'm an 18-year resident of the Central Neighborhood. My kids are finishing their last day at Green Central today, our incredible community school, and moving on to Lindale next year. In an effort to build the political and public will to engage changes in teacher equity at MPS, and in order to move board, the board towards active steps to create more access across the district to our most experienced and effective teachers, I'm leaving this comment. I'm a school social worker. What I know as a person who sits with many kids trying to find a pathway to a settled body and an authentic experience, I know that this is so key to kids accessing their confidence, their executive functioning, and their ability to really learn at school. I also know that students of color experience a disproportionate number of behavior referrals and that schools don't have to provide behavior data in connection with specific teachers who are, who are giving those referrals. I know that students of color do not have the opportunity to have teachers who look like them or reflect or understand their cultural grounding in most cases. I know that students of color experience racism in the classroom, and I know that there's a distinct trend in our district that in schools where there are more students of color, there are teachers with less teaching experience. It is district policy and state and federal law that students of color have access to equitable distribution of teachers. We need to do more than lip service to change the ways that white supremacy is weaved into how we actually enact our district policies and, and engage our political will. We need to re-examine how we create access to the most effective teachers and the most effective learning environment for the students who need it most. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Ellison, Superintendent Graff, and directors of the board. My name is Kenneth Avon, and I'm a resident of the Bancroft neighborhood. Uh, I'm also the part of the Advancing Equity Coalition. I feel like I've said this before, but I think it's worth saying again. Leadership matters. Leading with a bold commitment to racial, racial equity does not matter any less today than it did a year ago in the wake of George Floyd's murder. The job isn't done by removing police officers from school buildings and then releasing solidarity statements. This district and board have the power and responsibility to eliminate institutional racism in Minneapolis public schools. We have a system of teacher movement and distribution that is driven by teacher choice and replicates the historical racist patterns and trends of our city's resources moving towards whiteness and wealth. That is something that you all can take tangible actions to disrupt and dismantle to ensure students of color and low income students have access to the teachers to meet their needs and the every student Succeeds Act and World West Workforce legislation requires you to do so. Our ask is simple. It's that you take the opportunity to lead with a commitment to racial equity and make it a public priority to disrupt these racist movement patterns through your policies, practices, and contracts to better meet the needs of our students of color across the district. Thank you for your time. I want to thank those who took the time to, to call in and share their perspectives with us. Next, I want to turn it over to Superintendent Graff to provide opening comments for tonight's meeting. Thank you again, Chair Ellison. Um, I do have a, a lengthy update to report to share with the board and public, um, but I want to begin by just uh, acknowledging that this is our last Board of Education meeting for the, the school year, um, our last, last business meeting for the school year. And of course, reaching this milestone, uh, the end of 2021 school year is no small feat. I also had the great honor of attending the hallmark of a school year's end uh, this past week with our high school graduations. And to thank you to all of the directors and uh, staff members uh, who were able to participate in those wonderful events. Um, at each graduation I attended, it was quite moving and touching to see the resilience, the positivity, and the hopefulness of our, our students, our staff, and our families. And it's taken so much for, um, from so many people to get us to this point. And I'm proud and grateful for all of our students, our staff, and families, and community members who did help us make it through this past year. Together, we navigated a global pandemic. We pressed on in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in the tumultuous weeks and months that followed. 
and we experienced nearly 18 months of social isolation and stayed focused on our goals. And so it was a, a special pleasure to be able to celebrate our seniors this year, both safely and in, in person. To the graduation coordinating committee, thank you for your flexibility and your responsiveness. To the school staff who have provided education and support during most of the trying circumstances, thank you for putting our students first. To our students and families, uh, congratulations and good luck uh, in all you do. And to our community partners and advocates who continue to push us to do better, uh, thank you for your continuing commitment and for finding ways to work together with MPS on behalf of our students. I also want to take a minute to highlight uh, one further point about graduation. And I think it would be naive for us to think that the graduation rates uh, were not impacted by the pandemic. Not only did the pandemic impact the education our students received, uh, it hindered our ability to help students make up for the, the damage done by the pandemic. And we learned from the Minnesota Department of Education recently that our, our graduation rates from last year came in and they were down by 1% overall. Now, over the last two years, we've had previously seen an increase of nine percentage points um, and 19 percentage points over the last five years. So within this, this year's results, uh, graduation rates for all students declined um, with the exception of our Hispanic students whose graduation rates went up 3%. And our homeless and highly mobile students um, increased their graduation rates by three percentage points. Additionally, we did have Henry, North, and Roosevelt High Schools continue their upward trend for the second consecutive years, uh, sec excuse me, the second consecutive year, all increased by six percentage points in the uh, terms of graduation. So it's important to note also that when we talk about uh, data, we do encourage people to look at trends over time rather than just one year point. Um, and to remind everyone that in the past years, we've been able to gain two to three percentage points to our summer credit recovery efforts. Unfortunately, the summer programming um, was not possible last year as we've done in the past. And we're hopeful that our expanded summer programming this year will reverse this trend and bring us back to annual increases of supporting our students. I also wanna share a bit of information with you tonight about our planning and community engagement around how our district is um, attempting to designate the federal emergency COVID-19 dollars that we're expected to receive during the next school year. The funds that are most recognizable are those called elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds or ESSER one, two, and three dollars as we refer to them. The ESSER one and two dollars have already been received by our district. And in presentations to our American Rescue Plan Advisory Committee, we've shared how a portion of those funds have been allocated so far. And you can read more details about uh, that on our homepage. If you're interested, you can go to the link, look for one-time COVID funds under the About tab. Currently, um, I'm working with leadership team to allocate the remaining ESSER 1 and 2 funds on urgent items that we need funding for right now. And we're looking at items related to supporting students and families in trauma. We're looking to find creative ways to support our seniors who still need credits to graduate or recovery credits. And we're training, uh, looking to train staff uh, to teach in ways that connect learning and school with students' experiences at home to increase the potential of uh, enduring positive effects on learning. And we will plan to share specifics about those projects and the funding efforts in the coming weeks. At the same time, we have continued to seek input from our American Rescue Plan Advisory Committee and student representative uh, Gabor Meskel um, is on that committee. We're also working with our MPS, MPS community about what they see as key priorities for the ESSER $3. And at our last committee meeting, we shared back what we saw as the themes uh, in their feedback and also heard a few ways that we need to amend our understanding of what we heard. So just the, some of the overarching themes that were highlighted, um, one being social, emotional, and mental health supports. The committee said over and over that we need to help our students and families recover from the trauma 
of the past 18 months, and uh, we, of course, absolutely agree. Another theme has been the academic programs to address learning loss. And this has already begun with our expanded uh, summer programming and plans for ways to help our seniors recover credits um, as we're currently talking right now. And we will move forward with additional efforts related to literacy, math, um, and instruction um, that we know will reach our students in ways that they can also better relate to. Uh, third theme is around safe and healthy buildings and facilities. And this broad category does include items related to air filtration, COVID-19 protocols, building modernization and technology access. A fourth theme um, is a focus on equity. And I wanna be clear that the committee had strong feedback um, to us saying that this cannot be a standalone theme or bucket. Uh, they were very clear about saying that equity must be infused in every area of our work. And so we uh, appreciate that feedback and we agree with um, what we received so far. Additionally, we had included within this theme items around staffing, including retention, recruitment, uh, professional development. However, again, we heard from the, the committee loud and clear that staffing or talent or human resources also needs to stand on its own in a separate uh, category. Um, so we appreciate the feedback and also believe that separating these suggestions out will help us be more deliberate in making our decisions, as well as uh, more transparent in our communication and uh, accountability. So what you will see in the future is that uh, information around um, themes will not include a singular equity bucket. Um, and they will be included in a, a, a focus of human resources in some way. Another theme was around transparency and accountability. And it was recommended we need to be very clear about how we decide on the use of these funds and then ultimately how they are used. And then um, another theme was around community collaboration and partnerships. We all know the saying it takes a village. Um, you know, Minneapolis Public Schools needs to work with our community groups to support our families and students in whatever ways we can. So um, look to seeing more conversations around that theme of community collaboration and partnerships. And then finally, the good news is that our timeline for doing all this um, is longer than we first anticipated. Minnesota Department of Education has communicated to us that the application for these funds uh, will be due on October 1st. And this does give us time to synthesize and to thoughtfully incorporate the feedback of many of our stakeholders. And we're committed to clearly communicating our process for prioritization and more opportunities for the community to share their thoughts and ideas around how we strategically allocate these funds. We will also provide regular updates to the board as we continue our planning efforts and encourage community members to visit the ESSER 3 page on our website for information. And then finally, uh, I wanted to provide some brief context and background on, on a few of the items on the agenda for board action this evening. Uh, first, as Chair Ellison mentioned earlier during the public hearing, the resolution to close Tuttle School building before you tonight is required by state law because Heritage Academy is being relocated to another facility, which means there will no longer be any educational programming in the Tuttle building. And as a continuation of the discussion that started a few months ago in our, our finance committee, this fall will bring forward a recommendation to process, um, rec will bring forward a recommendation process to address surplus facilities which um, are no longer needed for school or other purposes. Also before the board this evening is uh, um, your approval for the proposed 2021 2022 district budget and corresponding capital plan. This proposed budget does maintain a commitment to our core priorities, um, invests to help our students and community recover from the pandemic, as well as it ushers in the, the bold structural change through the first year of the comprehensive district design implementation and uh, finally demonstrates continued fiscal responsibility for our district. And I do want to acknowledge and thank the, the finance department um, staff for their work, uh, the district and school leaders for their work in, in developing this, this recommendation, as well as our school communities 
uh, for helping us you know, continue down the path of having a, a balanced, aligned budget to the board's values and priorities. And then lastly, I wanna thank the board for bringing forward the resolution condemning gun violence. And I'd like to voice my support for this resolution. For years, we've heard our students call for action to address gun violence and the hor horrific and ongoing loss of life on the streets of Minneapolis calls attention to how little has been done. And on behalf of our school staff who seemingly daily must address the realities of gun violence in our students' lives, um, MPS joins with the board in calling on those who can affect change to act urgently for our students and our community. So thank you again uh, to the board for your work and support of these action items this evening. And Chair Allison, this completes my opening remarks. Thank you, Superintendent Graff. And I, I do wanna thank all the staff for their work this past year, um, this past 15, 18 months, um, as they navigate the countless challenges and crises that they've encountered as well as continuing the work of educating our students. So thank you, staff. Um, for that, I hope you're able to enjoy a relaxing summer vacation. Um, for the next item, policy committee report, I'm gonna turn it over to committee chair, Director Polly. Sure, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Ellison. The co policy committee spent its final meeting of the school year focused on a few data related policies. So for first reading tonight, we are recommending a proposal to repeal our current policy at 1040 and adopt three distinct policies. So one for student data, employee data, and public data requests. All three of these new policies are aligned to state and federal law, and they follow the Minnesota School Board Association models. Uh, the committee also forwarded two items that are on tonight's agenda, a formal adoption of the state's records retention schedule, which is on the consent agenda, and a recommended EDA project for next school year on school fundraising. Uh, that concludes the policy committee report, Chair Ellison. Thank you, uh, Director Polly and committee members for the, your work on that. Um, are there any questions on the policy committee report? Mm. Okay. As mentioned, action on the policy changes will be taken at our August meeting, and we're going to vote on the other two items tonight. Next, we will vote on several items. And for the sake of those listening, I will note again that since this meeting is being conducted in ele by electronic means, we must take every vote by roll call. Board members, please unmute yourselves when, um, or turn on your microphone when the clerk begins to call the roll so we can be as efficient as possible. First is approval of the consent agenda. The consent agenda includes routine items that do not involve major policy, budget, or taxing decisions bond awards or items related to the superintendent's contract or evaluation. Director Caprini, will you please move approval of this item? So moved. May I have a second with last name for the record? Second, Ernestin. Thank you. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Please raise your hand to be recognized or let me know. Seeing no hands. Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll on the consent agenda? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Alamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surio. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yeah, to avoid a conflict of interest, given that uh, the contract is with my employer, I do abstain on item 982F but I do vote yes on the rest of the consent agenda uh, per Amy Moore. Thank you. Thank you. Director Caprini. Aye. Dr. Palazzi, yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the consent agenda is approved. Our next item is the resolution mentioned earlier on the closure of Tuttle Elementary Building. As noted, this action is being taken in accordance with state law since the only remaining educational programming located within the building will be re relocated to a more suitable space next year. As a reminder, no testimony was provided for the required public hearing on this item. Can I please get a motion to approve this resolution? 
So moved. Thank you. Can I get a second with last name for the record? Second, Caprini. Thank you. The resolution to close the Tuttle building has been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized or let me know. Director Ali. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would like to ask Superintendent Ergraf, what plan does he has in mind uh, after the closing of this building? Director Ali, thank you for your question. Uh, there are probably two parts to your, your question. The first is around um, how do we support the students in their transition? And so they will obviously be um, trans transferring to our Wilder facility, which is currently housed by Wellstone. The second part would be what do we do with the actual facility? And as mentioned um, previously in my announcements, we have been working to develop a, a process that we are looking to bring back to the board um, probably in early fall to, to share how we are going to um, look at not only the Tuttle building, but a number of our facilities and evaluate whether or not those are still needed for school um, uses in the future. And so that will be part of a, uh, an opportunity. We'll bring that information back to the board with a finalized process for how we address um, buildings that are no longer going to be used for educational purposes, the Tuttle building being one of them. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Arneson. Thanks, I just have a comment. I just want to acknowledge um, the, the long history of the Tuttle building uh, with the neighborhood of the South East, Southeast Como, the Southeast Como neighborhood. It's, um, this building has been closed before. It's, uh, it has been a school before. It served many different ages. Um, it, it's been around for a long time. So there is a, there is a history there and I think that's um, worth acknowledging. And I, I know that no one aspires to live next to an empty school building. It's not really, I've never met anybody who hopes to, hopes their house is next to an empty building. So that's why I uh, think it's really important for us to develop a system for our unused buildings. And I appreciate Superintendent Graff's um, uh, discussing that today and that the, the, I appreciate the process that has begun in the finance department and I look forward to um, bringing that back. It sounds like late summer, early fall, so that the, uh, the neighborhood around Tuttle and neighborhoods around our unused buildings can have some closure through us being clearer about our intent on how to use these empty spaces. Thanks. Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Ali. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Is there any information you can share with us what the neighborhood is saying about? Do they have any ideas? Do, since they are also stakeholders, do they have any ideas or are there any discussions what they would like to see this facility to happen? Thank you, Director Ali, for your question. Uh, I think, uh, again, at this point, what we've been doing is um, we started this process around the relocation of... Uh, Heritage, I believe almost a year and a half ago, and um, did communicate to. I'm aware of the heritage and that part I understand very well. But what I mean to use is that after the, after the, already the heritage moved. So my question is that, is there any ongoing discussions about the neighborhood that we would like to be aware of? Yeah, I would say um, Director Arneson has, um, you know, represented this area for some time and I've kept her in the loop in terms of the, the process that we're engaged in with regarding the school um, and the discussion about uh, the, the future of it, the plans of the building itself. Um, I've not had any direct contact with any community members. I know that, um, again, as we've had that conversation, we've been public about the, the process with uh, the school closure information, both um, directly through um, the website as well as the the publications out through the school community and um you know again it's our intent to to make sure we don't look at this as just one unique building because we have several buildings for consideration and so trying to develop what that process would look like for um both this one and future ones um is what we're attempting to accomplish here with uh, bringing that information forward in the fall director Arneson. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. At this, I'd like to speak to that, uh, if that's okay. I have I have represented uh, this this building falls within District One, which is you all know is the area that um, where I'm elected. So I have spoken to the neighborhood association or leaders from the neighborhood association, and I won't. Um, I, I can't speak to uh, the extent of the of who they of um, I guess how far or how many of the neighborhood they represent, but we have had conversations. They're very aware that the building is is that the students are leaving the building. As I mentioned, this is not the first time that that has happened to this neighborhood. Uh, there's been closures in the past, and um, so I wanted to be very intentional about making sure that we kind of that they were aware and. Um, as you we noted, they did not provide any testimony tonight. And I think that is at least in part because their neighborhood is familiar with this happening and they've already begun conversations with uh, city officials and uh, kind of imagining what um, what sorts of needs their neighborhood might have and how, how this building perhaps or this space um, might serve their neighborhood. So I'm not going to speak to their um, like feelings, as I mentioned, it's always there's always an element of sadness when you see a long a building with a long history, a school with a long history, leave your neighborhood. But I might also just say that there I, I have cautious optimism that there is also um, some unmet needs that could be fulfilled by that space. And they are anxiously looking for leadership from our board to complete the process through finance so that again we can provide some closure and to this neighborhood and and let them know. Um, how how we might want to use or not use this building in the future so that they can envision um, what the, what it will mean to their neighborhood. And as I mentioned, I want to be clear that the city council office and city leaders are also aware and so that they can provide the support necessary. We are not developers, school district. We are not in a position. We do not have capacity to be developers, um, but that's why it's really important to have relationships with other public entities and, and um, in District One, at least we do have those relationships, so they are familiar. They are they are aware. Director Ali, I hope that answers your question. Okay, seeing no more hands, Director Pauly, can you please call the roll? Point of order. Uh, there is a hand raised. Chair oh, Ellison, oh I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Director Caprini. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Ellison and uh, uh, Vice Chair uh, Arneson. I'll make this very brief. Um, I too have spoken to not nearly as many people as uh, mm -hmm. Vice Chair Ellison, or um, I'm sorry, Arneson has simply because she does represent that area um, or for that matter, City Council. But I have spoken to a few community members who are excited about what's possible for Tuttle. And I also wanted to make sure that it's clear that because it's still our property, it's going to be maintained. It's going to, the, the, um, it, it will not become blight. So that's what I'm trying to say is basically we will continue to make sure that it's well taken care of um, so that there are, if there are neighbors who aren't aware of, of what's happening, um, that the, uh, the, the land won't look like uh, the Adams family for the lack of a better, better way to put it. So that's it, thanks. Thank you, Director Caprini. Um... Sorry, Chair Ellison, I just, if it's okay. Sure. Um, I just want to add that also the neighborhood is, we've had conversations and the neighborhood leaders at least are very aware of the state of the building. They've had discussions and that is, I know one of the um, challenges and one of the re primary reasons behind this recommendation from administration is just the state of the building. It does not have air conditioning. It has some plumbing issues. It has some drinking water issues, just it's an elementary facility. There's, there are significant um, structural and operational challenges to house students. It's an old, old building and the neighborhood is, is aware of that as well. And also I just add that they are working with our operations staff um, to, should we make a decision, as we make a decision, they're, they're poised to work with our operations staff to get the information they need. They've already been provided um, some blueprints and other building details. Thank you. Thank you, Director Arneson. Director Alamein. Thank you, Chair Ellison. Um, I know we're talking about Tuttle, but I also wanted to bring it to the attention about some of the schools that have set in North Minneapolis, like Willard, like the Gordon Center, like Lincoln, um, and just that we remain intentional about how these buildings are used and make sure that we are 
leaving room and space for a community partnership to be able to say what um, can happen, what could possibly transpire from these different buildings and stuff. So just wanted to maybe just mention that this again, as we are trying to be more intentional about the use of these facilities as they sit and we have an option to help build our community. Um, let's try to work to remove all the red tapes and the barriers that have always been there before our communities here in Minneapolis area. Thank you. Thank you, Director Elamine. I think that'll be part of the process. Um, Superintendent Graff discussed when we come to back in the fall. Yes, again, we're, we're looking forward to bringing forward a recommended process to address uh, the surplus that we have in facilities and, and certainly um, are hoping for it to be early fall, um, but we'll keep the board and community apprised of that timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is everybody good? Any other questions, comments? Director Polly, can you please call the roll on this resolution? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Elamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surreal. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polly is yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the resolution is approved. The next four items have been referred and recommended by the board's finance committee. The first of these is approval of the district's 2021-2022 budget. Treasurer Caprini, will you please move this item? So moved. May I get a second with last name for the record? Second, second. Thank you. The 2021-2022 budget's been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. Hmm. Seeing no hands, Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll on next year's budget? D uh, Director, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Director Arneson. Thank you. I just actually had a just a couple of quick questions okay. um, and I, I am I apologize if we discussed this last month and I'm just not remembering that but I, I think they're pretty quick one I'm just was a little unclear um, just from the presentation on here what is the what state funding is this budget assuming are we assuming zero until the budget passes <clears throat> superintendent do you happen to remember or no Director Arneson, I just want to make sure I'm hearing the question and I'll ask Senior Officer Giop to address it. You're asking what does the current uh, budget development include for the legislative funding for the current session? Yeah, what is it assumption? What is the assumption? Is I saw the slide of the assumptions and I was, no. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that we're assuming 0% given that nothing has passed at the state, but I just wanted to confirm. Yeah, thank you. Senior Officer Giop, would you confirm please? Uh, Chair uh, Ellison, uh, Superintendent and Graf, members of the board. Uh, yes, we did um, um, make some uh, assumptions, and one of the assumptions that we made concerning the uh, raise or percentage raise uh, was based on what we knew at the time of that budget development, which would be a uh, flat increase in, 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 in general fund or state fund or state dollars. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I just have a, actually a second question about process that alluding to your comments earlier, Superintendent, you mentioned, and it, this is mentioned as well in the written documents that we, again, don't, there is um, some federal relief dollars that have not yet been allocated. So of course we didn't put them in this budget. So I just want, and you mentioned we're working with our, our community group and you're coming back to the board. I just want to confirm, I, that there's a process that we will come forward with a budget amendment at some point uh, with these extra dollars. Is that that's a, a plan in that that budget amendment will include at that point more specifics about um, a variety of different interventions that we have planned with those resources. Is that just would like to confirm that? Yeah, Direct, Director Arneson, um, again, we have in this particular budget, ESSER 1, ESSER 2 dollars. Um, the, what you're referencing, the additional money, ESSER 3 specifically, have we have not been, um, 
we have not completed our application for submission, um, but certainly as a part of that timeline I mentioned that we're revising things with, um, you, yeah. would see, you would see something coming back to the board with an amendment. Um, and Senior Officer Giup, if you have anything additional to add, now would be a good time. Uh, yes, um, as we have indicated in previous meetings, especially uh, the finance committee meetings, I did say that um, later in the fall, we would be bringing before the board a budget amendment uh, for any uh, state funds that, uh, I mean, when we would decide how to use those carryover funds from SO1 and SO2. So that is definitely going to uh, be the case. And we, as the superintendent mentioned earlier, We've been notified that the applications deadline for SO3 would be August, uh, not August, but October 1. And yeah. so anything that is done uh, with any new money, be it from SO1, SO, no, SO3, that would uh, trigger a uh, budget amendment that we would be bringing before you. Uh, so that you know that the budget that is before you right now, if there is any change, be it a penny or a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand, we would make sure to bring it back to you uh, so that you can see that the budget that you approved in June on June 15th is being increased by X amount because of this or, uh, or for, because of this source of revenue or that source of revenue so that you can be uh, informed throughout the process. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I know that that's always our process. I thought it was worth stating. Uh, there's, it's, we, budget amendments are not uncommon. It is certainly unusual, though. To uh, this particular year is kind of unusual. We know we know that more money is coming. We know it actually might even be a lot of money, but we don't know when, and we don't exactly know how much. So I thought it was worth just kind of stating uh, before this vote that people can expect um, a rather significant budget amendment at some point. Thanks. Thank you, Director Arneson. I think even the application for this money works to our favor because we've talked about how this is a grant and, um, and how we want it to keep the budget separate anyway. Um, so I think when we come back with the budget amendment, we will be just be addressing the SR3 money. So I think you know, that's helpful for us in our discussion. Um, Director Polly. Thank you, Chair Ellison. Um, I just wanted to point out, I really appreciate the attached budget memo that shows the tangible ways that we're investing in literacy and other you know, board priorities, district priorities, such as student mental health services, recruiting and retaining teachers of color, staff of color, early childhood programming and school climate framework. Um, you know, As community members reach out, they always ask about the budget and what are we investing in. It's been really nice to have that as something to point people towards. It's really easy to understand everything in those buckets. So I just really appreciate that being something that we can use to share with community. Thanks. Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Director Caprini. Uh, thank you, uh, Director, I'm sorry, Chair Ellison and uh, Director Polly for your comments. Um, you were heading, you are right on the same track that I was. Um, it's super helpful to have those, um, those notes. And I, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Senior Officer Giop and his team for the work that they've put into um, putting this budget together. It's been a long, hot, summer year, two years, and the work that's gone into it has just been incredible. And uh, I can, I, I've seen from my own, with my own eyes as finance chair, uh, where you've done your due diligence to ensure that we are hitting the marks of the goals and values of the board. And um, in my history with Minneapolis Public Schools, uh, prior to being on the board, um, you know, knowing what I knew then and knowing what I know now, I've never seen anything that is so um, transparent and um, right up the alley of, of, of working towards um, meaningful work that's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take hard work and I see your team doing that and I appreciate you and, and all the folks that work um, it, underneath your umbrella. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Director Caprini. Director Ali. Did Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. And Superintendent Eric Graf and Chief Senior uh, Officer Diop. I am very delighted to see that the additional funding, federal funding, has been separated from the current budget. And that's uh, as we are having ongoing discussions on these matters, and you are looking into the community input. That's really creates 
transparency and we want to make sure that the community play a big role for these discussions. So I, I, I really thank you for that. So thank you. Thank you, Director Ali. Uh, Director Inns. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chief Diop, I'm wondering if you know off the top of your head um, what the estimated cross subsidy will be next year for uh, special education and for EL students. We can't hear You're you. You're on mute. Here. I'm sorry, we can't hear You're you. You're on mute, senior officer. I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I just, so, uh, and again, thank you for the question, uh, Director Ince. I do not know off the top of my head how much it would be. However, what I do know is that uh, it will be present. And going by what the previous years have uh, shown, I don't see it anywhere less than the 56 million that uh, we've, uh, we've seen uh, a year ago or even uh, this past year. So um, it is substantial, and it is uh, it is a it is a it is a big number. Fifty six million is 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 a, is a substantial number. So I do not know uh, the exact amount. What I do know again is that uh, we would be facing it, and it would be uh, an important number. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chief Diop. I know that I just want to again highlight. You know, I don't feel like we can pass a budget without mentioning. Um, I don't want to. I I know that. Um, you know, we've talked about a lot. We've raised the issue. It's become, uh, in the last few years, it's become more of a present issue. And I know right now there's a, a bill at, at the um, U.S. Congress to uh, fully fund the IDEA Act. Um, currently, the you know the original promise was for 40 percent of special education um, to be funded through the federal government. Currently, they fund about 15 percent um, of that. So they're down, you know, um, you know, they're funding it, I guess, at a level of, what is it, about 30, you know, about a third of what they said, a little, little more than a third of what they said they would fund it. So um, uh, board directors, uh, Superintendent Graff, I know you, um, folks continue to work with the Council of Great City Schools, um, the uh, Association of Metro School Districts, the Minnesota School Board Association, all of our organizations um, and a anyone really who's uh, invested in public schools really ought to be concerned about this issue. Um, uh, you know, I, we've, we've recently um, seen some emails, folks talking about special education and um, uh, um, advocating for special education students more. Um, and, you know, I think as a, as a public school system, and a believer in public schools, um, it, it just res represents a, a promise that is not kept by um, our, our public institutions. So um, we can say again and again and again, you know, we want to serve every student, but um, uh, certainly our state and federal governments um, have not been able to do that. So um, just want to point that out again. And then, you know, because we then choose to, um, and that's not really a choice, right? But because we fund our special education out of our general education budget, right? There is a cost to our schools in other ways. So just wanna again, highlight that. Uh, anybody that's um, at home, when we pass a budget, that is a huge part of what makes our budget work is because we are able to do that. So, um, uh, thanks, Chief Diop. Um, board members, again, we should, I don't think we should ever let this issue go. And in the coming years, maybe we'll see some change at the federal government. Hopefully, um, this bill will make progress. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Inns. Uh, Superintendent Graff? Yeah, thank you, Chair Ellison. I just want to take a moment to highlight the work that our finance team has done. I think you're all aware the last couple of years, the the Government Finance Officers Association has um, recognized Senior Officer Giop and the finance team for their uh, their work. And we're, I'm pleased to announce here again tonight that they were once again awarded the 2019 School Budget Award, um, which is quite a, a, an honor and a distinction, especially um, over the last couple of years where we've seen this happen uh, for this department. Um, do know that that award is being replaced 
um, with the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, which will be a, a new opportunity for the finance team uh, and the administration to strive for in the future, but wanted to just reinforce some of the comments I heard this evening about the work that our finance team does and, and uh, publicly acknowledge Senior Officer Giup and others. So thank you, Chair Ellison. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, and thank you, board members, for that discussion about the budget. Seeing no more hands, um, Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll on approval of next year's budget? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Alameen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surreal. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Dr. Polly is a yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the budget is approved. Next is approval of updates to the 2021-2022 capital plan. Director Caprini, will you please move this item? So moved. May I have a second with last name for the record? Second, Cerrillo. Thank you. The 2021-22 capital plan update has been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized or let me know. Seeing no hands, Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll on next year's capital plan? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Alameen. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Cerillo. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polizzi, yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the item is approved. The next item is approval of the long-term facilities maintenance 10-year plan. Director Caprini, could you please move this item? So moved. May I have a second with last name for the record? Second, LME. Thank you. The updated long-term facilities maintenance 10-year plan has been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands, Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll on this item? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Alameen. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Cerillo. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polizzi, yes. Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the item is approved. The final item from Finance Committee is the capital funds transfer labeled 2021-0027. Director Caprini, will you please move this item? So moved. May I have a second with last name for the record? Second, Elamine. Thank you. The capital funds transfer labeled as resolution 2021-0027 has been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand or let me know. Seeing no hands. Director Polly, will you please call the roll on this item? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Alameen. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Cerillo. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polly, yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the fund transfer is approved. The next item is approval of the EDIA project for the next school year, which is referred and recommended by the board's policy committee. Director Polly, I'll turn it over to you for this motion. Thank you, Chair Ellison. I move that the board directs the administration to conduct a full equity and diversity impact assessment 
on school fundraising policies and report back findings and recommendations in accordance with our policy 1304. Second, Ernestine. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to, to conduct an equity and diversity impact assessment on school fundraising policies. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. Director Caprini. Very quickly, thank you, Chair Ellison um, and uh, Policy Committee. I am incredibly excited about this particular conversation. It has been a hot button item for several years since my 17 year old was in third grade. And my hope is that through this uh, EDIA, through this discovery of, of how um, this particular policy uh, supports or undermines um, opportunities uh, for schools and for students that we're able to come to some kind of even medium. I realize that I'm, I'm not looking for um, things being equal, um, but equitable. And what can we do as a district to ensure that um, the areas that are, are capable and able to uh, produce and support um, m more uh, opportunities for for other um, for for students doesn't stop, but we're we're able to lift up areas where um, I'll refer to Director Arneson's uh, great um, analogy um, during a conversation prior to the vote of the comprehensive district design of parents pushing um, a um, a cart up a hill full of rocks. So I'm looking really forward to this uh, conversation and I realize I'm not on the policy committee, but I will be attending um, those conversations um, to, to just listen to what the policy committee has to say and also welcoming um, conversation from uh, the community. Thank you. Thank you, Director Caprini. Director Polly, would you like to speak more to this motion? Uh, sure. So thank you, Charlison. The policy committee, um, we spent time this spring reviewing our policies as they relate to school and community groups, um, like for example, like PTOs or school foundations and how these efforts intersect with our schools. The superintendent and staff have brought forward the recommendation for a full EDI on this topic and our policy committee concurs. Um, so I'll also note that the staff will be conducting an internal EDI review of school site council policy this year as well. Nice. Thanks. Thank you. Director Arneson. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Director Polly, for summarizing that up. And just wanted to just add, I said this in, in the policy committee, but it's worth noting in this larger committee, that there is an opportunity to connect this to our athletic, previously done athletic EDIA and just the parent fundraising or the private fundraising that goes with athletics as well. So there's a, there's a, connection point there and just wanted to note this has been discussed in policy as well, um, including the, um, the evaluation of reviewing uh, EDAAs or the recommended action and I think that's been decided that that will continue to go through a policy so there will be an opportunity for us to just kind of keep track once we do these EDAAs. That's where, that's where one should look. Thanks. Thank you. Um, seeing no more hands. Director Polly, will you please call the roll on this item? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Elamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surio. Yes. Director Ains. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polly is yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the item is approved. The next item is a resolution awarding a bond labeled 2021A. Director Caprini, will you please move this item? So moved. May I have a second with last name for the record? Second, Ernestine. The capital funds transfer labeled as resolution awarding the bond sale 2021A has been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized or let me know. Seeing no hands, Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll on this item? Dr. Arneson. Aye. 
Director Alameen. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surio. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polly's yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the bond sale is approved. Our next item under new business is a resolution condemning gun violence and calling for action by our policymaking colleagues. I will move I will move approval of this resolution and ask for a second. Second, Caprini. Thank you. This resolution has been moved and seconded. As I look for anyone wishing to speak on this item, I will start by using my space here to convey a very basic demand of safety on behalf of our children. They, as young as elementary school students, were saying, stop killing us. Guns down so we can play. Let us live. Stop killing us. Guns down so we can play. Let us live. Stop killing us. Guns down so we can play. Let us live. I hope we hear their words um, in our heads over and over and over again until we take every action we can possibly take to end this crisis. Looking for any hands. Anybody else want to speak on this? Director Caprini. Thank you, Chair Ellison. I, um, I, I truly appreciate this resolution. Um, it's, um, it's so incredibly needed. There, the violence that is happening across this country due to gun violence um, and then just narrowing it into our um, city in Minneapolis and then in uh, pockets of, of Minneapolis North um, center south. Um, it is, it's truly exhausting. And um, I can't imagine what it feels like to be a seven year old that desperately wants to be able to just be free and walk about, but has a parent who is so shattered with fear about allowing them and accommodating them to, to be able to, um, just walk in areas where they have in the past and not have any, had anything bad happen. We're we're all aware of the tragic deaths of of all of the the young babies that we've lost over the last six months and the um, the continuation of unrest that's happening with gun violence. Um, just random gun violence. Just a few weeks ago, we had um, in in my own um, in my backyard. Well, my, not my backyard, but in my back alleyway, um, a gun battle, and we found uh, shell casings um, j right in our alleyway, and uh, it, it woke us up in the middle of the night and frightened all of us. And the, the, we popped up, shut all, you know, ran to the windows with all the lights off to see if we could see anything. And of course, it was just all like people moving and running away quickly or driving away quickly, but at the end of the day, something has to be done. We've got to get to a place in this country where we're no longer afraid to make decisions that are not going to get you reelected. Um, make the tough choices and, uh, uh, and do the right thing with gun violence. It's gotten so far out of hand that um, I hate feeling afraid just going to the post office, but going because I can't keep myself from living. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Caprini. Student Rep. Gabra Um. Okay. Uh, I just uh, resolution a bit about gun violence in general and experiencing as a student. I've kind of grown I've come to feel that the norm that like hearing every single week about another school shooting or a mass shooting that happened. All of us became very concerned about school. Um, but at the same time, or my peers, or anyone in my school building at any school, and that I could, you know, hear screams in the hallways, and then suddenly um, someone I knew would die, or that I. with virtual learning and with also a lot of the quarantining that's been happening. 
only things I can actually say that have gotten a little bit better for some students did not have. Um, and I just feel like, you know, a single resolution isn't going to change any, any not going to change things overnight, but I think we need to be more focused on this because no student should ever have to feel afraid or being in their school building. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Seeing no more additional hands. And uh, Director Ali, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'm supporting this resolution. And I'm condemning this gun violence to the strongest term. This is, this is unacceptable. It's really, uh, particularly what's happening now in Minneapolis, in northern Minneapolis and, and south Minneapolis, you may say it. It's terrorizing our communities. It creates fear and, spare, and it's sparing no one, including children. And as an institution, we are passing this resolution. We want to also make sure that uh, we should not stop there we have to, in any way, in any shape, that we can be part of this solution, of finding solutions for this crisis, uh, we have to be part of it. And I wish to see that this has to be uh, ongoing discussions as we are part of this uh, community. Uh, uh, it is, uh, I don't know how, what to describe it, but as I have communications, and I am part of this particularly uh, black community, we are going through a tough time. And, and I wish to see also that a lot of solutions come from the communities, our communities, that how we can make sure our community get peace and harmony that they deserve. It's unacceptable that. There's a gun violence almost every week. Uh, it reaches the, the point where even people attending the funerals are no longer feel safe. We are demanding accountability from every angle, from every branch of the government to be part of, the to be part of this solution. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Ali. Uh, Director Elamin. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Ellison. Again, just kind of echoing what other directors have said too as well. Um, I think this resolution is, um, scratch, is a scratch on the surface, but I also think that we gotta be more, take more action. Um, from us personally, from us uh, collectively, for us to be present within our community. Um, this gun violence, it, it's the age that is happening continues to get lower and lower. We're talking about our middle schools now, not just our high schools and how it's affecting our community. And so again, um, I, I support the resolution, but it, it is a scratch on the surface and we just have to be more diligent. We have to be more visible. We have to uh, be more vocal. We have to just try to allow those resources to um, combat what is causing our youth to run to this era of violence. And so as we continue and as we talk about it, um, I just want to see us not only just talk, but show action and provide some resources and whatever we're able to do to help combat the violence that is taking place within our community. So thank you. Thank you, Director Elamine. Director Inns. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna say that I uh, also appreciate the comments of Director Elamine quite a bit, recognizing that, you know, it's one thing for us to pass a resolution, but it's another for us to think about as a school system what we can do to make a difference and how we can educate, provide resources, whatever it is. I think we ought to be thinking about that um, as a 
um, you know, a public good. What what is our role? How are we supposed to in our schools do something to prevent gun violence as well? So maybe this resolution will be an impetus for that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Inns. And I think it's like Director Caprini said, we we know the answer. We just need the political will to um, to do something about it. So thank you, um, board directors. I renew my motion to approve this resolution and ask for everyone to join in supporting it. Um, Director Polly, can you please call the roll on this resolution? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Elamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surio. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polly's a yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the resolution is approved. Our final item this evening is time for directors to give a brief update on committees they chair or on any other board related activities. Directors, please raise your hand or let me know if you want to report anything this evening. Director Caprini. Uh, thank you, Chair Ellison. Um, mine isn't so much a report on any committee um, that I'm heading. It's more of just a comment on some of the, uh, the heartfelt comments that we had tonight during our public comments. And I wanted folks to, to know that um, speaking for myself, and I, I can imagine only that other directors um, were listening as intently as I was, that I hear you. Um, and when it comes to uh, some of the asks that we all want, that um, uh, families want about retention of, of teachers of color, um, teachers want that, staff wants that, the district wants that. It, it, it makes me um, think about the reality of what we're actually living. And I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. So the federal uh, government, the, um, the uh, Department of Agriculture uh, recently, I think it was probably in March, um, and, and I'm still learning a lot about this, um, there was a bill to um, forgive 120% of loans to farmers of color uh, uh, Hispanic, Latinx uh, farmers and indigenous um, farmers. And uh, these dollars, millions of dollars was going to support them um, from the inequities that they've dealt with for hundreds of years due to the way that the system works. And uh, sadly, there's a group of farmers that are taking the government to court to fight back. And why is that? When so many um, non-farmers um, of color have received billions of dollars in bailouts for their, for their um, loss um, with their farms. So, so I, I say all of this um, because when, when folks advocate and fight for something that I desperately want, are we going to get to a space just here in our tiny little, our tiny little spot in this um, educational sphere, Minneapolis public schools, regardless of what everyone else is doing, are we going to get to a place where we have the um, the wherewithal to be able to get to a place where we can use language that's going to bridge some of those wants and desires that people are asking for. Because the way that I hear it is, um, and, 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 and tell me if I'm wrong, it's against the law. It's, it's discrimination. You can't say, you can't do that without having the language to back this up. So I'm frustrated. I, I'm actually leaving this meeting not just because of the comments that were made um, prior to our um, business meeting, but because of the reality that this isn't just a Minneapolis public schools problem when it comes to equity. This is 
the state of our country. So how can we be leaders in creating a different reality? So when you show up for negotiations, what are you willing to give up to make sure that we're giving our students the very things that everybody says that they want them to have? That's it. Thank you, uh, Director Caprini. Um, Director Ali? Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Superintendent Airgraf and all the staff members who put this together, this event of graduation celebrations. I, it was a joyful moment when you attend those uh, events, graduation ceremonies. And when you meet the students and you see their, you know, how emotionally they're excited and happy, um, I, I wish for all of them a bright future and successful future and congratulations to all of them again. Superintendent Graf, thank you. Particularly, I want to thank the, all the school principals. I know it's not an easy to put this event. We have gone through a tough time, but I'm also very happy that this year we had a, you know, great celebrations. So thank you. Thank you. Director Ali, student Rep. Gabriel Mesco. Um, I, I just also want to say my congratulations to all seniors who are graduating. Um, it's been a pretty unprecedented year for everyone and a very challenging year for everyone. And I think at the very beginning of the school year, it was really hard to see how things were going to end up. It was kind of like the light at the end of the tum tunnel. Um, and so I just wanted to congratulate everyone for getting through the many, many obstacles that we face and getting used to virtual learning and trying to still connect with our teachers and still connect with our friends and still um, keep up with our, both our mental and social well-beings. Um, and so I just wanted to congratulate everyone, but especially seniors, for getting through that and getting to that other, the other end of the tunnel. So. Thank you. Director Inns. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also wanted to say congratulations to all the uh, graduates this year and uh, comment on how great it was to be able to attend um, graduations again after not being able to go last year. Um, and just, you know, how important that is, you know, for a culmination of what we're trying to do here. Um, and I think if we think back to last year, how difficult it was for everybody to not be able to have uh, the in-person graduations and. Um, I appreciate all the work that everyone did, all the staff. Um, a lot of, I know we had some folks, some old staff volunteer to help out as well. Um, it was great to see them. It was great to see, I think we all had the experience this year of graduation of saying to somebody at some point or another, hey, I haven't seen you in about a year or more than a year, right? So Director Ali and myself, I mean, I got to give Director Ali a hug for the first time in a year and a half. Um, we got stuck in the elevator today <laughs> together. <laughs> we weren't stuck, but anyway, um, it was, it's just really great to have that experience again. And I wanted to say thank you to all the staff that worked so hard and all the students that worked so hard so that they could be a part of that and supported their peers and all the families that supported students all the way through to graduation. So congratulations to everybody and, um, uh, Thank you, everyone, for making that happen. Thank you. Uh, Director Arneson? Thanks. Uh, our, I, our echo and um, agree with everything that's been said. Congratulations on the thanks thus far. Um, but I also want to add, as we end this school year, as we end kind of this the school year and the school board meeting. I, I know we have one more, but just want to acknowledge just the challenges of hybrid. Uh, some people in person and some people um, on the screen and how really difficult that is for technology. And so I just wanted to take a moment to thank all the, the people who are 
in the board area right now, making our hybrid meeting happening um, all year. I know that our teachers have become, um, had to become experts to it, but we also have a host of, of staff here um, running our, our hybrid meeting and it's super complicated and hard. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Caprini. Thank you, Chair Ellison. I wanted to take a moment just to isolate one group to say uh, a big ups and a thank you and a huge hug to iDream TV. The, the work that they have done to produce all of our graduations, all of our board meetings, and a host of other things that they do with MPS is absolutely amazing. And I never had any idea of what went into the production of all of it, but to have had the opportunity to see this from the other side and the uh, the going betweens and the runnings and the workings and it's always perfect and nobody ever knows when something goes wrong and that is a true testament to their dedication and their hard work and their just their uh ability to be um top notch in in what they do so um thank you um ed paul and your whole team i dream tv you guys do fantastic work that's it for me i promise no more <laughs> Thank you, Director Caprini. Um, let me say, I too really enjoyed the graduations, um, especially after not being able to be in person last year. I mean, we really learned how much we value um, that interaction and coming together with folks. And so um, thank you, staff, who, everyone who was able to pull that off um, for us and for our students. Um, I'm the Pi Mud coordinator. I just want to mention one thing um, we had a virtual Bidet Makaska celebration. Um, I wanna thank the staff who showed up early on that very cold morning um, to welcome the water to us and to thank um, the water for us. And I look forward to next year when we can have hundreds of students celebrating around Bidet Makaska. Um, and, and the same, under the same bucket um, coming up, principals are gonna have a um, Indian Education 101 professional development. And I'm sorry, I can't, I've attended many of those and I love them. I won't be able to attend this one. It's going to be similar to the one, the professional developments that are done in August, two days in class, and they're gonna do a sacred sites tour. Um, and so principals enjoy, have fun, um, learn a lot. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and Black Parent Advisory Committee is meeting tomorrow night virtually, so people who want to attend um, get online and you'll be able to find them um, but that's all I have anybody else seeing no more comments I, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting so moved second Jordan thank you there's been a motion to a and second to adjourn director Polly can you please call the roll Director Arneson aye Director Elamine Yes. Yes. Dr. Ali. Yes. Dr. Surreal. Yes. Dr. Inns. Yes. Dr. Jordan. Yes. Dr. Caprini. Hi. Dr. Polly's yes, Dr. Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion passes and we are adjourned. Have a great summer, everybody. Thank you.